Hello and welcome to DW's International Reporters Magazine World Stories with me, Leila Harak. Coming up on today's show, Mexico soars to new heights, plus books come to life for a young reader in Bulgaria, and Saudi satire pokes fun at family squabbles. That's still all ahead. But we begin our journey in Latin America, where Mexico is officially open for business. Its economy is flying high, making it a desirable place for companies. The country attracts a substantial amount of foreign investment that creates and supports new jobs. Civil aviation is one growth sector that is taking off in a big way. One international company produces chopper hardware in Mexico, and to keep up with the latest high-tech developments, it's invested in training highly specialized engineers. Televisión Educativa's Gerardo Martinez Fernández takes us on board. Mexico's economy is rapidly emerging as one of the largest in the global marketplace. Foreign direct investment has increased sharply over the past few years. In the automotive, pharmaceuticals and electronic sectors, for instance. And now civil aviation, too, seems to be flying high. One example is French-based Eurocopter, a market leader in helicopter production. It supplies parts and maintenance for helicopters in 25 countries. Its CEO, Serge Durand, originally from France, is enthusiastic about Mexico and its business-friendly climate. Of course, Mexico's proximity to the United States is a strategic advantage. Eurocopter has had a unit in Mexico for decades, but the company is expanding its operations in the country. Recently, it opened a new aircraft parts factory in the central state of Querétaro. The initial phase required an investment of about 73 million euros. Querétaro is some 200 kilometers north of Mexico City. It's seen as the cradle of Mexico's independence, and now of its aviation industry as well. Eurocopter works with young and talented engineers who train in the company's own school. For an emerging economy, Mexico produces very good specialists. One of those young talents is 33-year-old Ivan. He's already repairing helicopters, a big responsibility. There's no margin of error in aviation. You can't make mistakes. So it's a huge responsibility to work on an aircraft, whether it's a plane or a chopper. Just a few months after its completion, the factory is working on its first order, the production of doors for Airbus planes. Eurocopter also provides maintenance services, custom paint jobs, and specialized training. And the company has a helicopter pilot school called the Heli Escuela. It's based some 400 kilometers from Mexico City in the port of Veracruz. School director Eric Perez Velasquez says safety is the institution's highest priority. We want our school to set international standards. Jorge is a flight instructor. He teaches in this room. The practical part comes later, on board this helicopter, which has been thoroughly inspected. The training is demanding. We see each student who comes to us as a rough diamond. We keep polishing them bit by bit until in the end they become a beautiful gem. Francisco is one of the Heli Escuela's students. The school has trained a total of 51 pilots since 2009. It's well worth the effort for the satisfaction you get from flying. Pilot and businessman Angel Fernandez says he's very satisfied with the quality of Eurocopter's aircraft in general and of the helicopter he flies in particular. I switched to Eurocopter seven years ago and I'm still happy. Just look at this helicopter. I can let go and it flies by itself. From 1999 to 2012, over 225 billion euros was invested in Mexico. The government institution Pro-Mexico is working to increase foreign investment. Mm -hmm. Carla Masinet Bueno is Pro-Mexico's communications and PR coordinator. She's thoroughly familiar with the figures. In 2012, there were almost 10 billion euros in direct foreign investment, and for 2013, we're anticipating an increase to nearly 19 billion. Last year, more than 50% of investment came from the U.S., followed by 13% from Japan and over 8% from Canada. 
Pro Mexico, this is Diana Gonzalez. Can I help you? Mexico's industry benefits from 12 free trade agreements encompassing 44 countries. They give access to an export market of some 1.2 billion consumers. Earlier this year, Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto predicted that investment in 2013 could reach a record sum of 25 to 39 billion euros. He attributed the rise to economic reforms that he introduced at the end of last year. Companies operating in Mexico say the future for doing business in the country looks bright. We believe that Mexican aviation has a great future. Bombardier has become established in Mexico and will grow side by side. Eurocopter is just one of more than 250 aviation companies now operating across Mexico. Now, who doesn't like curling up with a good book? One young reader in Bulgaria loves a good read, so much so that the elementary school student has already collected an entire library of literature, from comic books to picture books to fiction and nonfiction and everything in between. This bookworm uses reading to open horizons, and he can't resist a page turner. Nova TV Nina Dimitrova has the story. Come in. Welcome to Marty's Library. It's not open to the public, but there are strict rules. Food and bubblegum are banned. Marty is brimming with childish enthusiasm as he shows us his book collection. Most of the books here are English. I have a few books over here. And many more over here. Here are some encyclopedias and history books. These are science books. These are fairy tales. More encyclopedias. More encyclopedias. More encyclopedias. More encyclopedias. 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 And some non-encyclopedias down here. Marty's library is heavy on science, but comic books can be found here too, in the cabinet under his bed. He calls them his secret books. Do you like comics most? Not exactly, but I like them a lot. Look, here's another encyclopedia. What's it about? Everything, look. Is it in English? Yes. Which do you like most, Bulgarian or English? English. Marty attends an English-speaking school. He says he started speaking English even before his native Bulgarian. I have lots of books from this series called Why. It's a scientific comic. Do you ask lots of questions? No, not at all. I don't believe you. I understand everything. How many books do you have? I don't know. Marty's favorite book is about the Titanic. What do we not know about the Titanic? If only five compartments flooded, why did it sink? At least seven had to have flooded for the ship to go under. Good question. Besides reading, Marty likes doing magic tricks. He learned most of them from books. This is one trick many jugglers do. An empty paper bag and... Hey presto, a flower! Do you want more flowers? There aren't any more. Marty's world is built on the magic of books. He says when he grows up, he'll become a juggler or maybe a writer. You never know. 
Next, in many parts of the world, access to clean drinking water is a huge problem. In Western Kenya, for example, water usually has to be boiled before it's fit for use. But there's a downside. Burning decimates forests and creates CO2 emissions that contribute to climate change. A few years ago, a Swiss-based company came up with a solution. It's developed a portable water filter that can prevent disease without the need for boiling. The company is distributing the filters throughout Western Kenya, funded by profits from selling carbon credits. The program is fittingly called Carbon for Life. Grit Hoffman explains. She's been away since six in the morning. Now it's nearly midday. Malia Tiambo is back from the mountain forests where she's collected nearly 20 kilograms of wood. The forest men, at times they chase us, at times, they, uh, at times we give them a little bit of something, even 50 bob, for them to let us pick the firewood. Because you know, without the firewood, you can't survive. Yeah. Mali uses the wood to boil dirty water from the river to kill the bacteria and other microorganisms it contains. She can't get water from a tap. She wants to protect her children from typhus and cholera, diseases that are spread by contaminated water and kill mainly children. Mali isn't a unique case. Hardly anybody here in western Kenya has access to clean drinking water. Almost everyone boils it over a wood fire to purify it. Buying wood is much too expensive, so they get it from the forests illegally. Kenya's forests have shrunk by almost 50% in the last few decades. Janet Omari wants to change that. For a year, she's been working for the Swiss company Vestergaard Franzen. She travels to the villages to offer people an alternative. Here in the region, she and her colleagues have distributed 900,000 of these water filters. Filters with pores so small they don't catch just dirt, but also bacteria. People no longer need to boil water to purify it. Now Janet is checking to see how well the filter, called a life straw, is working out and where there are still problems. Where well, we have to work still with the people is education. You know, change is gradual. So the only thing we need to do is educate our community about the use of Lystro and about the use of safe drinking water. Yes, so the only challenge we can say is like, we need to educate them more and inform them more. So once they're empowered with education, they know things will work out. The filters are completely free of charge for the families, but they aren't always received wholeheartedly. It took some effort for 15-year-old Sarah to convince her parents. They were used to boiling water and found filtering it too time-consuming. But it's not just clean water that's at stake here. Every filter saves on carbon dioxide emissions because the families need much less wood from the forest. Sarah now uses it only for cooking. Because of life straw, we are saving 2,000 shillings per in a week, in one week. So it has changed a lot? It has done a lot to us. Mikla Vestergaard Fransen heads the project. His company's primary products are mosquito nets and AIDS tests. Why are you panicking? He's invested 30 million euros in the water filter project. It still pays off. For every ton of CO2 he saves, Vestergaard Franzen gets climate certificates, which he in turn can sell on the carbon market. In the first six months of operation, we reduced carbon emissions by 1.35 million tons, um, which has been sold already to, um, to buyers who see this as highly charismatic carbon credits because it offers carbon offset and it does good. 400 kilometers away lies Kenya's capital, Nairobi. 
The certificates are sold from here through a partner company and this man, Tom Morton. Morton sells the certificates mainly to businesses in Europe and the U.S., companies that want to offset their own carbon emissions. He passes on most of the money to Vestigard Fransen, about 10 million euros in the past year. Tom Morton considers the water filter project highly sustainable because it's stringently controlled. So carbon finance is about being paid for outcomes. And if you get it wrong, then you are not paid. And so there's a much greater incentive to have a very robust system in place. Back to Western Kenya, to a sporting field. Vestigard Franson's employees are spreading good cheer. They've organized a football tournament. Football is very popular, especially with young people. The occasion is used to acquaint them with the water filter. Vestigard Franson wants to expand the project in Africa. Janet, his instructor, is prepared to go abroad if she's needed. As long as I'm going to do the same thing, as long as I'm going to change people's lives, to save a life, to save the environment, I'll go. I won't say no. I'll say yes. Next year, Vestigard Franson even plans to go to Indonesia with three million water filters in his luggage. The business model appears to be working. In Kenya, at least, a whole lot of people now have one worry less. Next stop is Saudi Arabia, where one female author doesn't shy away from using her pen to bring women's issues in her country out into the open. Her work lampoons the often fraught relationship between married women and their mothers-in-law. Her work not only holds up a mirror to Saudi society, her readers also get a laugh out of her books. Adnan al Misbah reports for LNTV. Saudi Arabia has a rich journalistic and literary tradition. But satire has seldom been part of that tradition. Basma al Sayufi is one of just a handful of female authors in Saudi Arabia who have published satirical works. Her latest book takes a humorous look at the relationship between married women and their mothers in law. In my book, I talk about the current generation of married women and how they get along with their mothers-in-law. I include tips and true stories that I've packaged using satire. I hope I can give young women in particular some ideas about the best way to deal with their mothers-in-law. It's well known that the average Arab reader doesn't have much patience with long-winded texts or long works of fiction. So there's a trend towards short stories. That way, thoughts can be served up in bite-sized pieces, so to speak. The very first pages of the book reveal the author's originality. The situations that Al Sayufi describes are a spin on the everyday life of the typical Saudi family. In the six volumes that she's published to date, she delivers a unique satirical and critical treatment of the interests and concerns of Saudi women. Readers are attracted by the versatility of her writing. On the one hand, she's very general, but at the same time, she's quite specific. That's what makes her work so exceptional. It's the way she writes her short stories, an almost pictorial style. It all comes together to make a very beautiful end product. Satire involves examining familiar situations and skillfully holding them up to ridicule. Doing that well is a measure of an author's talent and sensitivity to readers' tastes and preferences. 
All these aspects must come together for the work to really strike a chord. And finally, we head to Asia, where a project by the United Nations is helping to reduce poverty in Pakistan. The International Fund for Agricultural Development is making a difference in remote communities that have long been isolated. The project was initially met with stiff opposition, but it's managed to win the hearts and minds of locals by improving their living conditions and at the same time change attitudes towards education and women's rights. UNTV's Joanne Levitin has more on this story. Surrounded by some of the world's highest peaks, the Diyamar district in northern Pakistan is not easy to reach. Isolated for generations, the tribal people here have always been religious, conservative, and suspicious of outsiders. Until recently, there was little education. Women could not earn their own income, and people were open to extremist ideas. Now, all that has changed. Imam of the Central Mosque of Chilas, Maulana Muzammil Shah. Before, people from this area would go and trade in different areas of Pakistan in the name of waging jihad to protect Islam. After the project, a change came on the people and they stopped going. The project that caused such a change in people's attitudes was initiated by the UN's International Fund for Agricultural Development, or IFAD. Its aim was to reduce poverty, and it was the first ever development project in the area. But for the tribal people here, what the project proposed was initially hard to accept. Community organization manager Zahir Sher. At first, they said women's organizations had to be formed, but the social attitudes in this tribal area didn't allow women to gather or be mobilized. The project also brought a credit system with loans, but according to the people's perception here, those loans were un-Islamic. This was viewed as a threat to their religion and culture. The resistance was fierce. It came to a point that bombs went off. They were firing at the cars. Project engineer Sardar Gul. I was there myself in the hell. The cars were stopped. Tires were burst. Glass was blown out. We were only saved when people from the nearby village came to rescue us. The religious scholars in the area were deeply divided. It took four years before they agreed that the project activities were not against Islam. After this, the communities embraced the project and became actively involved in the decision-making. A road was built giving them access to markets, schools and health facilities. Clean water was channeled to their houses. The introduction of new crops and livestock meant people could feed themselves and increase their incomes. Despite the initial resistance, 140 women's organizations were formed. And for the first time, these women generated and managed their own incomes. With development came awareness. Our mindset was changed psychologically and mentally. Before the project, this area had a literacy rate of 9%, with virtually no female schooling. For people like sheep farmer Abdul Shakur, the project made education accessible, affordable and, most importantly, desirable. Look at me and those who came before me. We are all illiterate. But now, all our children are educated. Before, we only lived our lives in this small area. But now, we know this is a very big world. And as the people began to view the world in a different way, Development, education and peaceful living became a priority, and there was a shift away from extremist thinking. The real test of this change in attitude came in 2008, when locals say a group of extremists schooled in Taliban teachings tried to infiltrate the area. This Islamic scholar says that before the project, the extremists would have been welcomed here. We sent these people back because our future development was at stake. We want our development in education, in money, and trade. We want development for our people. This is only possible when there is peace. Now, this community no longer relies on the project to fulfill its needs. They've recently pooled their own money to generate electricity. And at a time when fundamentalism threatens world stability, they are proof that when people are exposed to a bigger world, attitudes can change. 
And with that report, we come to the end of this edition of World Stories. We hope you'll join us again next week. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, you can always find us online at dw.de slash worldstories. Now, here are this week's fakes of the world. See you next time.